your unique story, our global audience. Global One Media. Hello, and welcome to our series of interviews with decision makers and senior leaders of companies across the board to help you, our viewers, make informed and intelligent investment decisions. I am Munir Barazi, your business analyst and host. And today I am very pleased to welcome Kobe Hanush, the CEO of WeBit Nano a semiconductor IP company that specializes in the development of resistive random access memory, which is a type of non-volatile memory for the semiconductor industry. WeBit Nano is listed on the ASX as WBT. Hello, Kobe. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Munir. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. So could you start by telling our viewers who are not yet familiar with WeBit Nano about the company, its unique advantage, and how far it is ahead of its peers? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I'll start uh, by explaining. Uh, I'm sure that not everyone knows the semiconductor market. So you know, just very quickly, semiconductors are all around you. Uh, practically anything you touch has semiconductors in them today. And I think people have have noticed that even when they order uh, refrigerators or something, sometimes they're late because they don't have the semiconductors. Um, we're developing memory technology, which is the largest segment in semiconductors, and specifically non-volatile memory. So those are the memories that don't lose the data when you unplug them from the power, like a USB stick, for example. Um, <clears throat> now, this market is, is really booming now. Uh, the demand for memory is growing like crazy. Um, just think of all the TikTok videos or Instagram uh, or you know, obviously surveillance cameras and, and AI and so on. Um, so it's a very big market. It's expected to be uh, more than 124 billion uh, US dollars uh, in just a few years. And, and it's really exciting for us. Uh, the existing technology is called Flash. Uh, it's been around for ages, uh, and it's hitting more and more walls. So uh, WeBit's technology, as you said, uh, resistive RAM or reram for short, has many advantages over Flash. Uh, it's much faster. It's much lower power, orders of magnitude lower power. Um, it's uh, It has... Many other advantages, I'll focus on the two most important ones. Uh, you might know that in semiconductors, everything is shrinking. Um, there's what's called Moore's Law, some people know it. Uh, you manage to put much more silicon on every piece of, uh, much more um, <clears throat> components on every piece of silicon uh, all the time. Uh, flash has stuck, uh, basically at uh, 40 nanometers. It can't really shrink anymore. Uh, the world is continuing to shrink. We're down to 22, 16, 12. The more advanced designs are even at five and three nanometers. So obviously all these new, adva new advanced applications, they have a challenge when they want to add memory into their uh, design. Uh, so we can go down to the smallest geometries. We already showed that we're working at 22 and even now working with customers on, on smaller geometries than that. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is, uh, and the most important advantage is the price. We are much easier and simpler to manufacture. Uh, we add about five to 7% to the cost of a wafer, a silicon wafer. A flash adds about 10 to 20% to the cost of a wafer. And other memory types can even go up to 30, 40 and, and more added costs. So uh, we feel like we're in a very good position. The technology is very uh, competitive. Uh, we've been focusing on making it uh, easy to adopt. And uh, yeah, it's exciting times. Now we're transferring it to mass production. Fascinating. And as you said, the semicon semiconductors are essential in, in almost all electronics. And you're managing to push this technology further and make it more efficient. Can you elaborate a bit on the use cases and benefits of your technology for users? Perhaps you could mm -hmm. give real life examples mm -hmm. of how beneficial it is. Yes. Uh, so... I mean, first of all, just so you understand, any digital device 
needs uh, a non-volatile memory. So really any application needs it. Now, for every application, we have different advantages. Uh, for example, um, <clears throat> when you're talking about uh, uh, cars, today cars have hundreds, many hundreds of electronic components in them. There are so many sensors and other elements. Some of them are in the engine. We can operate in very high temperatures, for example. So we can actually fit in, in an engine of a car and, and work there. Uh, we're very low power consumptions. So all of the different IoT uh, battery operated uh, devices, you know, obviously nobody wants to charge in the middle of the day. You want the battery to last at least until nighttime. Uh, so we consume a hundred times less power than flash. That makes a huge impact on battery life. Um, you know, if you look at space applications where there's very high levels of radiation from the sun, our technology is uh, radiation tolerant by by its very nature. So, so that's a big advantage. And I can go on and on to many applications, but you can see that really in in every application has a list of advantages when they use. Uh, our VRAM. Those are great benefits. And I'm sure, as you said, we cannot come up with more benefits if we include also the ongoing AI revolution with the mm -hmm. with all of the generative AI tools. Um, if you could elaborate a bit on the current market opportunity uh, for your VRAM technology and, and about how you plan to establish a prominent position in this market. So it's really a, a very exciting time now in this industry. Uh, for years, when I would talk to people about RERAM, it was always, you know, really exciting technology, right? It's that future thing. And, and I'm very happy to say it's not the future anymore. It's here, it is, is now, it's available. And suddenly the whole market understands it. So we bit over the last 12 months, <clears throat> went through what's called qualification. So this is a very rigorous process that was defined by standards bodies, where you take hundreds of chips from uh, different manufacturing lots and you test them and you, you, you really torture them. Uh, and at the end you show the results and you show that the chips pass, they meet the specification, there is uniformity and consistency, you know, the things that you want to see in mass production. So we actually have that stamp of approval that we're ready for mass production. Um, we also already signed an agreement with the first commercial fab. A fab is where you manufacture semiconductors. And <clears throat> we have wafers from that fab that are functional and we're now uh, qualifying them and, and doing all the testing there. So, you know, we showed that our technology is ready. Um, in addition, uh, they're the biggest fab in the world, the TSMC, announced that they have uh, RERAM technology. So it's really, you know, it's legit to ask for RERAM and, and customers are now going to all of the fabs and asking to have RERAM. It's more advanced than Flash. Um, and so we're we're really seeing the, the other fabs, all of the big fabs are looking for rear amp technology that they can provide. They need to compete with TSMC. Uh, one of the things that happened is that many of the rear amp providers uh, have basically disappeared, uh, you know, for all kinds of reasons. Um, some of them tried to work with non-standard materials. Uh, in this industry, it's, you know, being non-standard is a very challenging thing. These fabs that I'm talking about, the simplest ones cost billions of dollars to set up. You know, even Apple, Google, Facebook, they don't have their own fabs. They go to what's called foundries, which are big companies that have fabs open for the general public, if you want to call it that way, and manufacture there. Uh, yeah, making bringing something which is not standard to these fabs is is really a huge challenge. It's it's extremely costly, so they don't like it. We have focused on using only standard materials, standard tools, standard everything. That's why it's so easy for the fabs to adopt us. 
So there are some other reram players out there, but in reality, um, for all kinds of reasons, uh, we are really the the leading uh, player. And today, uh, I'm very happy to say that the majority of the top fabs in the world are already engaged with us in different levels of discussions, evaluations, uh, etc. And uh, the potential is huge in terms of market size. Um, there are two separate market segments here. Uh, one is, I mentioned that everything shrinks all the time. Today, you can put a full system on a single chip, what's called a system on a chip. It has a processor, it has communication, it has uh, sensors, all kinds of things, and obviously it needs memory. Um, so you embed the memory into that chip, and then the product company takes that and manufactures it in, in a fab, in a foundry. So we um, that market is estimated to grow. It's, it's practically non-existent today, and it's expected to experience a very rapid growth to order of magnitude of $3 billion in 2027 already, and obviously continue that very, very rapid growth beyond that. Um, and and by the way, I didn't. I guess I did mention the the size of non-volatile memory is is over a hundred billion U.S. dollars. Um, another application is when you have chips that they are completely only memory, basically. So we call them discrete or or standalone memories. And in that market, you have a lot of smaller segments. We are already starting to go into some of these segments. Uh, you know, each one of them is order of magnitude of about $3 billion. So we're already addressing um, a market which is maybe getting close to $10 billion. And obviously it will continue to grow until it eventually gets closer to that $100 billion mark. Very impressive. And there's certainly a lot of potential there. And you've managed to overcome that challenge regarding the use of standard materials. Um, but what other challenges are there when you're trying to scale this technology and what are you doing to overcome those challenges? Well, developing semiconductors in general is very, very, very challenging, and very difficult. Uh, you know, I mentioned the fabs. Fabs uh, are a are hundred thousand times cleaner than where you do open heart surgery. You know, it's it's hard to even grasp that even one speck of dust is 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 like a bomb falling in the fab. So, you know, you need to really work. Now, I mentioned earlier what we're talking about are elements that are measured in nanometers. You know, a nanometer. I know it, most people can't even think about what it means, but it's it's ten to the minus nine of a meter. And you know, if you put a nanometer next to a cross section of a human hair. It's uh, even smaller than when you put a mouse next to the Empire State Building. It's it's really tiny. You you need to be very very precise when you're developing. You're almost putting every molecule in its place. So the development of semiconductors is a huge challenge. Um, normally, developing a technology like this takes ten or fifteen years or even more. Uh, you know, Webit has been very fast to develop it, only seven years, uh, because uh, or thanks to our development partners uh, where we, we do the R&D and they have a lot of experience in memory and we're leveraging their experience. Uh, so uh, it's very hard to go into the technical details of the challenges, but I think you're getting a feel for how complex this is. It's no wonder that fabs cost billions of dollars to set up. It's very delicate machinery. Everything is extremely delicate. Uh, each time you want to test something, you know, when you develop a software, you just recompile and, and you know, within minutes or hours at maximum, you, you have a new version. In semiconductors, when you send something to manufacture, it's many months until you get it back and you can actually test if what you fixed is working. So it's it's very challenging, all of this. But it seems like you're on top of all of those challenges. Um, and my last question has to do with uh, any updates or catalysts that investors might want to hear about. Well, uh, the big news is that we're no longer just focused on R&D. 
and we are qualified and we are working now with the large uh, foundries. So the, the big thing right now is more developing the business. Uh, we're expecting to, uh, to start signing agreements with uh, some of the large foundries. Uh, we're expecting to start signing up some customers. Um, again, it's it's a, that's already also a huge challenge because since everything is so costly here and the risk is so high, people are very naturally hesitant to to sign up on a new technology before they actually saw it working. You know, nobody wants to be the first one, so it's it's a big challenge. But we're making very good progress. People are seeing the results. They're testing our technology, uh, they're seeing uh, that it works, that it has good results. And that's really the, the big focus this year, to, to get uh, to the point where we start having these agreements, uh, you know, even very initial uh, revenues, but really starting to move into that uh, direction. Very promising, and I'm sure investors will be watching for all of those updates. Colby Hanish, the CEO of Webit Nano, Thank you so much for sharing all of those updates and insights. We look forward to seeing you again and hearing more updates from Webit Nano soon. Thank you very much.